Condors declined precipitously during the 1800s and 1900s. The main reasons were shooting and poisoning. Many, many condors were shot, some for scientific purposes and as museum specimens, some maybe because they're big, easy targets. The poisoning came in two forms. First, people used to put out poison carcasses to kill predators like wolves and bears and coyotes. And unfortunately, condors and other scavengers became indirect casualties. The second form of poisoning is lead poisoning. If condors feed on an animal that has been shot, they may ingest lead bullet fragments or lead shot that remain in the animal. And if they do so, they're likely to die. And I'll discuss lead poisoning, which is currently the greatest threat to condors later in this talk. Condors also reproduce unbelievably slowly. They typically don't begin breeding until they're six to seven years old, and they lay only one egg every year to two years. So once condor numbers were not down, the population just couldn't bounce back. By 1982, only 22 condors remained in existence. Drastic measures clearly were necessary to save the species. In 1982, a captive breeding program was initiated. Biologists took eggs that were laid in the wild and they raised them in captivity. And if an egg is taken early enough in a pair's nesting cycle, the pair will recycle and lay a second egg. So in that way, biologists were able to double the number of condors that were produced in any given year. Several wild nestlings and adult condors also were captured uh, to become part of the captive breeding flock. But although the captive flock began to grow, wild condors continued to die throughout the 1980s. By 1984, only nine condors remained in the wild. By this time, though, the total population was starting to increase because of that growing captive population. But the decision finally was made to bring in the last few remaining condors into captivity. And the decision was unbelievably controversial. It literally tore apart the conservation community. Some conservationists declared that condors should be allowed to die with dignity. And they said that bringing the condors into captivity would ensure their extinction. Fortunately, others believed that since condors likely were going extinct because of human-caused reasons, that humans should do everything in their power to save them. And they felt that it was critical to protect the few condors that were left. Wild condors were disappearing fast at the time, and no one knew why. So they felt that they had to bring the last few into captivity or they were going to lose them. On Easter Sunday, 1987, the last wild condor was captured and brought into captivity. And for the first time in tens of thousands of years, no condors graced North America's skies. With the initial successes, oh, sorry, sorry, for the next five years, um, the captive flock began to grow. And finally, in 1992, after experimental releases with Andean condors, the first group of California condors was released back to the wild in California amidst tremendous fanfare. And these are two birds from that very first release in California. With those initial successes in California, it was decided that a second distinct population of condors should be established so that condors could still survive in the event that a disease or some other tragedy struck the California population. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service contracted with the Peregrine Fund, which is a nonprofit group that had had tremendous success reintroducing peregrine falcons in North America to conduct condor releases in northern Arizona. Unlike in California, however, where condors are considered an endangered species, the Arizona condors would be released as a non-essential experimental population. And some of you may have heard of that designation because that's how wolves were reintroduced back into Yellowstone. Essentially, it means that under the clause of the Endangered Species Act that designates a population as non-essential and experimental, that clause is known as the 10J clause, Basically, all landowners that would get condors on their lands could continue any and every legal activity. So having a condor come in and land in a snag in your property meant you could still cut down that snag. The bird wasn't an endangered species. It was non-essential experimental. So it shouldn't affect anything that you did on your land. And this is the current 10J boundary that encompasses most of northern Arizona, southern Utah, and Nevada. So within this area, condors are a non-essential experimental population. In December of 1996, the Peregrine Fund released its first six condors from northern Arizona, and condors have been released in, the, uh, in Arizona every year since. The Vermilion Cliffs, as many of you know, are located just north of the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon system. The Grand Canyon area is incredibly remote. Condors were successful in this area for tens of thousands of years. Condors nest in caves, and caves in the Grand Canyon are nearly limitless. Food and water are extremely plentiful. 
The birds love to play on the river beaches and bathe in the river. Soaring conditions are spectacular. It's really hard actually to imagine a better place for condors than the Grand Canyon area. Each condor that's released to the wild is raised in one of four captive breeding facilities. And upon hatching, every condor is given a stud book number in the order that it's hatched. And for those who work in the field with condors, these numbers ultimately become their names. And you may have gathered that from Marker's introduction. Um, this condor's name is 281. At around six months of age, which is fledging age for condors, or the age at which they leave the nest, each condor is outfitted with a set of wing tags identifying markers. And ordinarily, that consists of a stud book number. So condor 281 or tag number 81. Uh, the birds are then transported, usually by plane, to their respective release areas. And when the birds are released to the wild, they'll each wear two radio transmitters. And those are conventional transmitters up above and on the bird's wings. Um, biologists can track the bird's movements using those transmitters. Some of the condors also now wear satellite transmitters, so their movements are tracked by satellites. Currently, captive raised condors are released to the wild in central and southern California, in Arizona, and in northern Baja, Mexico. Different entities are responsible for each of those different reintroduction sites, and as I've mentioned, condors in Arizona are released by the Peregrine Fund. Upon arriving in northern Arizona, at the age of six, month, um, six months of age, juvenile condors are transported in large dog kennels uh, from the airport to this large flight pen on the Vermilion Cliffs. And you'll notice in the front of this Pen, there's what looks like a power pole. Well, in the early days of the uh, reintroduction program, electrocution was one of the leading causes of mortality for reintroduced condors. So now every flight pen in Arizona, California, and Mexico contains a mock power pole setup that gives the birds an electric shock when they land on it. Um, it's always sort of gruesomely entertaining to watch these birds land on the tallest, best perch in the house and start getting little shocks on their feet. Uh, they, they very quickly learned that this was not the good, good perch to be on. Um, as a result, this type of mortality has dropped dramatically. Indeed, we've had no electrocutions in Arizona since implementing this power pole aversion training. And there's a, you can see in this picture as well. During my tenure with the program, we would watch these juvenile condors from the blind for hours every day. We evaluated each bird's behavior, made sure that they were eating well and staying healthy, and we would decide at that point which birds were ready to be released to the wild. Usually the most dominant, confident, uh, and heaviest youngsters were the ones that we selected to release first. Here's a picture of maybe condor. I'm going to do my, my best to show you that condors can be pretty cute by the end of this talk. <laughs> they won me over, so... Once we've chosen uh, which young birds to release to the wild, we caught each individual with a big fishing net, uh, we put on its two radio transmitters, give it a health check, and then we transported it to this smaller release pen that was located right on the edge of the Grim Lake Cliffs. And after a week or so, we would raise the gate at the front of the pen. We were in a little box at the back so we could raise the, the gate remotely and let the young condors fly free. And this is just the view from the blind up on top of the Vermilion Cliffs of the release pen. Newly released condors face some major hurdles. The first is learning to interact with the other free-flying older condors. In particular, they must learn to feed and compete with those older, more dominant birds at carcasses. We help facilitate these things by teaching young condors to feed aggressively as a group um, prior to their release when they were still in the flight pen, and also by releasing only the dominant, confident youngsters that we were sure would be able to hold their own with the adults. The most important hurdle, though, that newly released condors overcome, uh, need to overcome after their release is learning to roost safely at night. If they don't roost in an inaccessible spot, they're liable to be killed by coyotes during the night. It takes young birds several days to develop their flight skills, to learn how to maneuver those wings. This is a bird coming in for her, for her very first landing as a free-flying bird. Not exactly the grace you associate with that. 